thank you all so much uh, for joining us here today. Um, this is going to be a conversation with uh, Rolando Gomez, who is our uh, Noyos, the Northern Ohio Youth Orchestra's 2021 22 uh, Arlene and Larry Dunn composer in residence. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Antoine Clark, who is the Philharmonia Orchestra conductor and music director, and by Arlene and Larry Dunn themselves, uh, who, who sponsor that program and uh, without whom we would not have this great world premiere that we're gearing up for here on April 10th and that uh, performance that will be live streamed. Yeah. We were just asking ourselves, do we know what date that is? <laughs> yeah, well, it's good. It's good to get this on the record then. April 10th. April hey, 10th. April 10th. Good. So I wonder if uh, if I could just start things off with a, a brief question to uh, Rolando about your background, how you came to study composition, um, and uh, what you um, what you find you know enriching about it, um, and what you hope to achieve uh, just as a composer in in general, and then maybe we can dive in a little bit more with more specificity about this particular piece that we'll be hearing soon. All right, thank you. Um, so I started composing around high school. Um, and that came about because I was studying classical music since middle school. Um, and really that's because some new school opened up in my uh, city, Miami, um, called Miami Arts Charter. And they were looking for students and my stepmother saw an ad for it. And at the time I was playing classical guitar um, because my father was teaching me. And really I come from a Cuban music background. I never really knew what classical music was. So I remember when I auditioned and they told me, well, you can't keep playing the guitar. You need to choose a different instrument. I discovered all these different instruments in the orchestra. I'm like, whoa, what's this? What's that? And ultimately I chose the cello. Um, so fast forward into high school and I'm playing, you know, more higher level repertoire. And I start listening to some 20th century stuff, in particular, the music of Kodai. Um, at least this piece, Harianos, you know, really caught my ear and I remember using Pandora back in the day when Pandora was more popular as a streaming service. Mm -hmm. And you know how Pandora works is that it starts recommending you different songs, especially from that time period. And I heard the piece, The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. And once I heard that my world was changed, you know, and I started looking more into how to learn how to compose music. Um, you know, I'd, I'd watch some YouTube videos on it and read some stuff online and write little pieces and, you know, after a certain period of time, those little pieces start to become, they start to grow. And before you know it, I, I had a portfolio to, you know, use to apply for schools. So I applied to many schools, one of them being Oberlin. And, you know, I get in, it was, and they gave me a lot of scholarship money. So it was very good. And I ultimately chose to come here. Uh, so yeah, those are sort of my beginnings. And in I, terms I, of, oh, guess. Oh, please, please go ahead. Fine. Oh, no, I mean, I was just going to go into sort of like my approach to composing, oh, which great. it's like two things. The first thing is that I always strive to try to communicate clearly to the audience. And many times that's very difficult, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like thinking about like, you know, how in poetry, because I'm a big fan of like poetry, I tend to read it a lot. Um, you know, there's metaphors, there's simile, there's different types of figurative language and trying to learn what's the equivalent for music and if I can make that clear to the audience, you know? And then the second part to it is of course, like um, it's about style, right? So blending sort of my Cuban style with an American style, because I'm a big fan of jazz and whatnot. And, you know, with the classical style and trying to see if there's a happy medium in there somewhere um, aesthetically, yeah. Yeah, can I can I make a, a just one ask? Note, um, which is mm -hmm. that I think I think you must be the first gen what, from the first generation of composers whose whose tastes and whose inclinations were shaped by a curation algorithm, by Pandora's Pandora's recommendation, oh, yeah. which is which is really oh yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's I think yeah. that's really really interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to, to see over <clears throat> over the arc of uh, the coming years how that affects how mm -hmm. people creating music are thinking about uh, music because their experience of exposure and, and uh, um, discovery was very different than generations before. Yeah, yeah, that's well, very true. Rolando, it's, it's really great to meet you. And I hope we'll have a chance in April to meet in person. This pandemic has screwed up so many things. Yeah. Uh, 
But what one thing I didn't catch was what year did you begin at Overland? I began in was it 2019? 2019. Yes, 2019. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, cute uh, anecdote. Um, I actually met Arlene in 2019. We sat together at a concert. Um, I don't know if you remember. I do remember. I don't think I have it on me, but we. Ha- oh no, wait. I think I do. We were having some small talk, and then you gave me your card. I have oh, it right man. here. Arlene Dunn. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was in Warner. Right. Yeah. So I remember when I applied, and I heard that name, Arlene Dunn. Arlene Dunn. I've heard this before. <laughs> I was searching my wallet and I find the car. I'm like, oh my goodness, look right. at who it is. I was probably laid up after my neck surgery when that happened, I'm guessing. Possibly. You know, or... Cause I don't think I was there. And that's, you know, I had, that, I had the neck surgery in the fall of 2019, so. I think that I, I met Rolando in the fall of 2019 as well, because I think that you had gone yeah. to a, 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 a um, I was speaking about Noyo for like, uh, uh, to see if like student employees were interested in working with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I believe we met then. And then I, you were doing some work also for the Oberlin Choristers around that time, I think. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, cool. Well, it was, yeah, I was, I was very happy to see your um, submission well, when you applied froze. for this. Pardon? Oh, I'm back. Okay. Uh, I was very happy to see your submission for the um, composer residence position uh, when you wrote it in, because I knew you a little bit going into it. Um, so uh, let me kick it now to Dr. Clark. Um, you know, well, let's let's come at the piece kind of from these two different directions. Uh, your experience of of learning the score and working with the musicians on it, and could you also talk um, as you get into that a little bit about uh, the changes that we've had to make to the um, concert season schedule uh, mm. on account of some some building closures um, and and how that's affected the process of preparing and rehearsing up this piece? Sure. Good to see you, Arlene and Larry. Hi, Antoine. Hi. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about uh, Rolando's piece. This is my third work I've been able to um, work with with on the, for the Arlie and Larry Dunn re- uh, composers in residence. And I, I'm really enjoying this. And I think the students, I know the students are really enjoying your work, Rolando. Um, you actually got to hear us uh, rehearse two Sundays ago. Um, well, it's going to be two Sundays ago. And um, I had such a great time getting into the meat of the piece with the students and really trying to communicate the language. And, and I think that's what's really fun for me is that this work has a really clear um, language that we can all like learn from, um, you know, whether it be how we express the rhythms um, or how we space notes. Um, I talked to the students quite a bit about uh, that it almost has to be declamatory like or spoken. Um, and we, we talked about uh, different uh, other composers and I was trying to just relate this information to them. So, uh, you know, and it's, it's a really actually, a, it's a challenging piece in a good way for the students. Um, if you think about rhythm, for example, and, you know, you're deriving a lot from Afro-Cuban music, actually, you know, uh, you know African and Cuban culture, um, you know, it, it, it throws the students for a little loop to actually, you know, have to put a little extra time in some of these um, uh, ostinato bass things that you laid down. And so I have fun, actually, uh, one exercise we did is I had the cello section stand up, for example, and we, I had them kind of dance to the music because they have to get their bodies connected to the rhythm. Um, I threatened them a little bit in the last rehearsal, but I didn't make them do it in front of you. (laughs) (laughs) They were like, no more dancing, Dr. Clark. So, um, but yeah, that's one thing I love about your work. Um, Just the overall color and texture that you really, really bring out in the music. It's so clear. Um, You talk about how this, your work, Capelia was an ice cream parlor back in, I think, was it Cuba or was it in Miami? In Miami when you were growing up? No, it was... It was in Cuba, right. but in Miami, growing up, there is this place called um, uh, Polo Norte, which is a mm-hmm. pizzeria that has 
more variety of ice creams than they do varieties of pizza. Right? <laughs> and it's supposed right. to be a reference on uh-huh. that ice cream uh-huh. parlor back Variety's in Cuba. Ice cream. Great. Wonderful. Well, you're going to yeah. hear that type of nostalgia in the work. You know, in the very beginning, um, he talks about <clears throat> you told a compelling story to the students about your sister and yes. that the, the two clarinets in the beginning that open are like you all having a conversation or singing with each other. Mm. Uh, and then uh, it goes right into this uh, violin solo that is supported by um, um, uh, strings that are sustaining with mutes. And it's just really colorful. I, I told the students it's almost like you're waiting at the bus stop in a fall morning and you see the fog over the ground, you know, that kind of feeling. And they resonated with with that type of imagery in your work. So um, yeah, I think, what else did I talk I like? I love that you use, um, uh, you give the, the students opportunities for solos. So we have a violin solo, there's clarinet solo and duet, there's um, a trumpet solo, tuba solo, and then you do a really good job of combining um, pairs of instruments. And I, you know, I really love the fact that you use another technique, um, which is call and response or even hockey, where you have one group playing uh, a melody and then another group takes it over. So I think those are just beautiful things that um, outside of just the cultural implication of it, it's like, wow, you learn how to play music using this music that you've written. So that is just, just beautiful. And another thing is, you know, Rolando uh, knew what our instrumentation was from mm. the previous cycle. He came in, watched our students, and, you know, try to get a sense of what they could do. Uh, but I love that you really fit the, or, the instrumentation to to the students that we had at the time, you know, if we had one clarinet or one oboe, you wrote for that. So that was really unique. And, and it's really good that we have a composer that can write for our ensemble, for our needs. So thank you, Larry and Arlene, for supporting these young people that can do that. So um, as for the changes to the season, yes, COVID um, got in the way. We were planning on doing um, an Amplified Voices program on on this coming Sunday, February 13th, in which we were gonna perform uh, uh, R- Rolando's work, in addition to Samuel Coolidge's, Coolidge Taylor's um, Sweet, uh, uh, African Sweet, uh, and a work by uh, Florence Price called Adoration, and a work by William Grant Still called mm. uh, Summerland. So um, because of that, we've, um, we've had to uh, change up some things. So we're gonna still perform Rolando's piece on April 10th, along with The Price and the Coolidge Taylor. Um, mm-hmm. And we also will uh, be doing Lift Every Voice and Sing in addition to our national anthem. So really still quite a bit of a, um, you know, a, a program that has diversity. We will also be featuring two of our uh, know your students who won the concerto competition, oh, uh, nice. a cellist and a tubist on that program. So we have a, a really large program to put forward. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, but really really excited about this, and I am I'm really excited that I get to work on this piece with the students. So thank you, Rolando. Thank you, thank you. Um, could you speak a little bit more about uh, how you? Um, uh, incorporated your, your 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 memories of the stories that you heard uh, about the ice cream shop into the piece, and and um, you know what are what are some things that happen in the piece, or particular sounds that come out in the piece, or or uh, you know sort of concrete musical markers in the piece that we can be looking for um, when we hear the piece in April that might um, that might sort of uh, connect it to the to the memories that you're talking about. Okay, well, in relation to the ice cream shop, I know one thing is that uh, my step-grandmother, or at least my grandfather's uh, wife, um, fun fact about me, I'm Rolando the fourth. So I'm referring (laughs) to Rolando the second here. Rolando the second. Yeah, his second wife. um, She actually developed Alzheimer's before she passed away. And whenever I would visit her, you know, she'd always be like offering me food, you know, very, very nice woman. Um, But sometimes she would confuse me for my father. Right. Ah, and she yeah, would yeah. 
And she would tell me, hey, remember the times you went to this ice cream shop? You know, I'd be like, no, grandma, you're speaking on my father, you know, who has the same name as I do, right? So it's even more confusing, you can imagine. Right. Um, so, you know, that's at least one of the most distinct stories I have on the place, you know, and then she would tell me, you know, remember, we used to go there and you'd order, you know, these different flavors, because the particular thing about this place is that they had tropical flavors uh -huh. um, as their sort of like norm, you know what I mean? Like yeah. guava, mango, pineapple, that sort of stuff. Let's go. Um, yeah, let's go. Yeah. In terms of, uh, in terms of specific places in the piece, um, I think one relationship maybe the audience can look forward to seeing sort of like evolve is that of the two clarinets, right? They come in the in the beginning, right? They play their little solo, and then once the music gets going, I actually reserve them. Um, and I don't reserve them until another part where the sort of after the fanfare, right? There's this little B section where the music sort of dies down again. Um, and they come in just for a little bit. So I sort of use the clarinet strategically in just reserving that color. So whenever they come in, it's an important marker, right? Something's okay. going on with the story. Same thing with the trumpet. Uh, the trumpet, and this is one of those instances where I attended rehearsal. And, you know, I was looking out for musicians, you know, musicians that who I really like the sound that they play. And, you know, I think the trumpet player, uh, you know, she very talented. Right. And, you know, my stepfather, he plays trumpet. So I sort of wanted to make a connection there with family as well. So I just saw a perfect opportunity there. So the, the trumpet's another important instrument that I sort of use uh, strategically which is why they have so many solos. And the other thing is that I use two trumpets, right? So I know trumpet players, they get really tired um, if they play for an extended amount of time. So I, it, they rarely play together. They mostly play separately. And uh, this is sort of more based on uh, how jazz trumpet players um, choose how to play. For instance, there, there's like two important designated trumpet players in a, like a big jazz band. One is to play like mainly solos and the other one is to play like high notes with the rest of the group, right? So that's the sort of idea I played around with, you know, orchestrating both trumpets. Um, it, was, it was very canny of you to, to notice that we had two strong trumpet players in Philharmonia. Yeah. And then to, yeah. to write for them in that way. Um, I think that was really, uh, that was really a smart move. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Oh, and there's, so another thing about the piece is that there, it's divided up into three sections, really. There's the very soft section, then there's a fanfare with the B section, then it goes back to the fanfare until it goes into this big crescendo. And then there's this other section where it's a bit more abstract. There I start to have a little bit more liberty as to what I do. Right, it begins with like the cellos coming in with a pizzicato in C, and then the woodwinds, uh, they start doing, they start playing like a little melody that's very simple, almost like a folk little, uh, what's it called, a uh, like a kid's tune kind of. Um, and there is sort of a reference back to my sister, right? Where I try, I my challenge there was, what if I take little folk tunes or little tiny kid melodies, right? and try to abstract them and, you know, make them a bit complicated, sort of like how Stravinsky would do in The Rite of Spring, that sort of idea, yeah. right? So I think that's another thing the audience, you know, can look forward to sort of just the difference in color and approach in like these different sections. So I have a fun little story to relate um, that uh, Antoine reminded me of. Uh, we're very excited about uh, hearing this piece in part because of the uh, uh, the Cuban references. We happened to go to Cuba in 2015 with the American Composers Forum uh, to attend the, um, the Havana uh, International Contemporary Music Festival. Um, and it was a wonderful trip and we, uh, you know, were exposed to a lot of things going on in, in Cuba. And one of the, so there were two of the important people that we met, one was, um, Ido Lopez Gavilan, who is a, a composer and conductor, very famous in Cuba, um, and is the director of the, um, at, at least at that time, was the director of the festival. 
Um, and we also met this, um, uh, uh, this woman who runs an all women orchestra um, called Camarada Romeo. And her name is Romeo, I forget what her first name is. But we went to one of their um, rehearsals and uh, they were playing a piece of, of Guido's uh, called, it's just like maybe his most famous piece is called One One Co, which is, I think is the name of the rumba rhythm if I'm remembering correctly. And it's all built around yeah. the uses of the rumba rhythm uh, in this piece. And it's for, it's a string orchestra. It's a piece for string orchestra. And um, when, they, when they play this piece on their concert, uh, they all get up and they dance while they play. And so the, you know, oh, the wow. bass and the cellos and everybody and, and the conductor, they're all dancing on stage while they play this thing. And I think we can probably find um, a, video. a video of this maybe online because it's, it's one of the most famous things they do as an orchestra. And when you were talking about um, making the, the cello or the, was it the cellist or somebody? Yeah, else? yeah. Um, and uh, it's really, it was really interesting to yeah, see how these uh, kind of organically developed, um, you know, folk rhythms uh, turned into this piece that the, they, like, they feel like the only way they can get it right to play this piece is that they get up and dance while they're doing it. And it was really amazing to see. One of the hot, whole highlights of the trip. Oh, it was, and and uh, you know, it's yeah. You play the cello, Wallando. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's not a, a you know, standing and playing is not your common. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, it was pretty interesting to watch these women uh, uh, maneuver, playing, and there's a lot of spinning of the instrument. Uh, yep. and the um, bases yeah. during the playing. Yeah. yeah. So that was really, uh, it was really beautiful to watch as well as listen to. Thank you, Larry. Now I can tell the kids I'm not crazy for having them yeah, dance. That's right. <laughs> well, if you find that video, you can show them the video. Right. Yeah. In fact, be, actually, this might be a fun, a fun piece uh, for the orchestra to play at some time. You need to evaluate whether it's got difficulties that they might not master, but it's a very cool piece, even if you don't dance while you're playing. Sure, sure. Yeah. I think if you program that piece, you have to have them dance, right? right. <laughs> well, they've all got to get up and dance. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great piece, great work. Um, I think that we're uh, close to the end of our time here, but I, I did want to uh, say one more quick word of thanks to Arlene and Larry for making this program possible. Uh, and I wanted to open it up if there's any closing uh, remarks we'd like to make. Um, I'm certainly very happy to uh, be able to feature Rolando's piece on, on our April 10th program and to, uh, to, to carry off this world premiere. Um, and I know the Philharmonia musicians are really looking forward to bringing it to life. Um, I think it's a piece that's going to benefit from having, uh, you know, effectively 150% the rehearsal time that these, yeah. these pieces <laughs> often have because it's a substantial piece. Um, yeah. But it's, but it's going to be very strong when it hits the stage. So I'm looking forward to it very much. Anybody else have anything else they'd like to, uh, like to add? Um, well, I'd just like to thank you guys for giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, this is my first commission uh, ever, and it's, it's a very great experience. Um, it was also the first time I ever wrote a piece by hand, you know, from start to finish. Um, so like that, you know, every single part got, you know, tender care. So it, it was a great experience, you know, but it would have been, you know, possible if it weren't for Noyo and for Arlene and Larry Dunn. So thank you very much. You're very You're welcome. welcome. It's uh, it's exciting for us to do this and to, and to provide this opportunity uh, to commission young people to uh, to write pieces for young people to play. Uh, that's that's the whole idea um, is to expose the Noyo musicians um, to create to play music of living composers. And to be right in it right. as it's created. Exactly. Um, yes. You know, it's created for them and they're part of the process. And I think that's such an incredibly important learning opportunity. And everything we're hearing you all say today, this is like incredible gratification for us <laughs> because this is exactly what we wanted to do. Exactly. Is what what you all are doing and, and how you're describing the experience from all the different uh, perspectives. This was the whole purpose in doing this. So. We are very 
happy. And very much looking forward to being there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs>